this one. Well, look, we're at 11.30. We're all here. We're all present. I suggest we get this show on the road. So welcome, everybody, to this kegged cider sales and marketing session here at CraftCon 2021. I hope you all enjoyed yesterday's um, uh, suite of fantastic sessions that there were. Big thanks to the Three Counties Cider and Perry Association for putting on an absolutely fantastic show. Uh, I had a hoot and certainly learned a great deal about um, a whole different range of aspects of cider. And it continues, of course, today. Make sure that you check out all the sessions. Head to the expo as well to, uh, to go and visit the fantastic sponsors of the show. But this session is a follow-on from yesterday's, which is all about the technical aspects of kegging. Today, we're talking about the more trade and the consumer facing things around the sales and marketing. And, you know, it's my opinion that keg ciders have got a, a huge and important part to play in the entirety of the cider category, but especially for smaller cider makers, of which <clears throat> may be brand new potentially to the idea and the concept of kegging cider. And so to help us guide through uh, this uh, this exploration of what one might need to consider, I have assembled a crack team of kegged cider experts. And so I'm going to uh, hand over to them very briefly just to introduce themselves, who they are and where they're from, and then we'll get into things. So Alice, would you like to kick off? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Alice Churchward, <laughs> known as Al, I guess, friends and family. I own the Real Al Company and Trap Tap Room uh, with my partner Ish. <laughs> Super, thank you very much. Oh, Martin, welcome, sir. Hello, yeah. I'm Martin Goodwin Sharman, uh, cider advocate, drinker, blender, but I've also worked in the trade for about 10 years now. Uh, ran a pub called The Cock Tavern in Hackney, which sold a load of cider and now work at The Good Measure in Bristol. Gabe, have you gone? <laughs> it, it froze on the grin, so it looked like you were like, is that it? I was like, I don't know how what else to add, really. I'm also in a podcast with Gabe, who has forgotten his microphone, even though it's a lovely bit of kit that would be so useful in something like this. I thank you very much. Uh, apologies, the gremlins of the Somersetshire internet not working so well there. If it does happen to drop out again, uh, you know what to do as a team. Continue talking and give us in your pearls <laughs> wisdom. Um, Ed, welcome today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, yeah, so my name is Ed, obviously. Uh, I am one of the co-founders of Crafty Nectar, and we are a cider producer, but also a cider retailer um, and, yeah, cider subscription service. But we also run an, uh, have an element of trade that we deal with as well. So... Yeah, keg sales guy, I guess is probably a good, good term. Keg sales guy. Very good. Nice nom de plume. Very good. Susanna, welcome. Tell us a bit about yourself. Hi. I own the station house in Durham, and we also recently, well, I now open Fram Ferment, um, which is uh, a bottle shop and bar, which in part to allow us to massively expand the amount of cider that we can we can physically uh, sell. So we sell a lot of bottles. We've got a lot of keg lines as well. Um, so yeah, I've been really, really, really pushing cider in the Northeast. I don't think there's anyone else in the Northeast that, that sells the range of cider that, that we do. And it's honestly, it's not just an excuse to, uh, to store all the, the <laughs> bottles that we want to drink ourselves, honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and if it were, we wouldn't blame you. Uh, thank you very much, Susanna. And last but very much not least, Mr. Sam Nightingale, tell us a little bit about uh, about, about your world of keg and cider. Hi there, I'm Sam Nightingale. Uh, I'm founder of Nightingale Cider, formerly Gibbet Oak, which is where the family farm is. Um, I'm based in Kent, so we make Eastern County style <laughs> um, dessert and culinary fruit ciders. Uh, we started kegging in 2018. Bravo. Thank you very much. Super. Well, uh, just as a reminder to everybody viewing, if you've got sort of general uh, chat and observations, do use the chat function. If you've got very specific questions, pop it in the Q&A so it kind of stands out and makes it a little bit easier. And for our lovely panelists, uh, I'm going to be helping to <clears throat> guide the conversation. But obviously, if you've got something bursting and pertinent to say, don't hold back. But first of all, Sam, I'm going to come to you if that's all right, as our uh, as our cider from the cider making perspective. Why 
why is kegging cider rather than any other pack format important for you? Well, I think it's it's accessible. It's on the front of the bar, and for me, that was always it was the game changer from being behind the bar in a bag and box, which is always a disaster, or being a bottle or a can in a in a fridge. You just don't have that visibility. So if you can either have a hand pull, or you can have a a keg badge at the front of the bar. You've got that instant connection to the punter. You've kind of you're up close. You've got their you've got their um that you've got their focus, and it's just you're talking about a sparkling, accessible cider, and it's just it's and it's a volume game as well. It's about moving volume, um, and it's it's it was key for us to be able to grow our business. Super, thank you, Alice. Just coming to you um, next from the. From the distributor perspective, obviously you um, you shift a lot of bottle products and bag in box products into the trade, um, but you have an interest in keg cider. What's what's your perspective on on what role keg cider has to play in the space and, and with the um, and with the pubs and the bars that you supply to? Yeah, sure. So it's it, it, when I first started in this game about ten years ago, um, bag in box was was the champion and. I've seen a really positive move towards um, publicans embracing keg cider. And, you know, previously it was just orchard pig absolutely everywhere. And it's now kind of, you know, we're starting to see the small batch keg products pop up more and more. And it's, it, I think it's really, really important because you've got so many drinkers who um, are a bit nervous of cider and they find the still bib option um, terrifying let's say um they just want something that's you know tasty refreshing hydrating and i think that that's why uh, a keg a keg option is so so important for us um and so we're, we're just starting that journey really on trying to uh, persuade gms to to choose a really nice small batch keg cider um and and maybe sacrifice a little bit of their gp but kind of you know really good choice and invest a little bit in a, in some better quality and um and i think we're gonna see some serious progress um you know bag and box is great but it just doesn't provide the same kind of opportunities that keg do um in exactly sam hit the nail on the head that visibility that you get from a from a tap badge on the on the on a keg um line is yeah it's crucial really so just for um, uh, just for the uh, the newbies to this kind of space, um, could you just um, tell everyone what what GP is and why it's important? Oh, it's gross profit margin. So yeah, <laughs> basically money, cash monies, and <laughs> and um, and the issues that uh, or the reason why I think we're all so cross with general managers. No offense, Martin. That's all right. <laughs> um, <None> taken. <laughs> but you were very good because you would actually pay ciders but yeah i think in the past it's been very frustrating for um cider champions to have to see uh, general managers select really really expensive beers um over expensive or over ciders which maybe had a higher price tag so you'd get a, a very very fancy scandinavian beer and then you'd get a very poorly made keg cider uh, uh, you know, sat next to it, and that would enable the, the the manager to make money that they need to make. So, did that make sense? If I said that in a way that is, it yeah. did until you said that, because now it sounds like it was more complex and it's gone over my head. So I'm like, <laughs> well, uh, well, yeah, but maybe not. No, no, it definitely did. Absolutely, definitely did. Amazing, yeah. uh, Susanna. I'm just checking that you can still. Uh, hear us. You've dropped off my. I can't quite see you anymore. That might be at my end rather than anybody else. Um, well, at Martin. Day, uh, oh, I was fine you. yesterday, so I don't. Mm -hmm. um, it's morning, but I, I am just about following. Yeah. Okay, super. Well, uh, let, Susanna, let's let's get your um, perspective. Oh no. Like <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, when, so she, when she comes back, back yeah. when she comes back, she can turn off her video, uh, and I think that will save uh, the her draining her kind of resource, if that makes sense. Bandwidth. 
Super. Well, Martin, let's come to you for somebody who's um, one of those general managers that Alice was uh, 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 referring to. You've had a, a long history of working in a number of different uh, pubs and bars, as well as considerable experience um, with brewing and with beer. What's your perspective about the opportunity and the role that keg cider can provide for, for craft cider makers and for craft drinkers, possibly? Well, I, the first thing, just to touch up on Alice's point there of like the manager and the purchasing of certain beers at certain prices and certain mm. ciders, uh, they're like a proper gatekeeper. And the problem is when you're in that position, you're looking at turnover of a month of a year on taps. And uh, cider for me has never been more than 5% of any uh, booze business I've ever worked in, which is just shocking as like a sheer figure. So you kind of even I love it to death, but pushing cider behind the bar, um, you've got to really, really, really believe in it to even think, oh, I'm going to take the time and I'll make money on something else to then drop the GP, like Alice says on this. Yeah. So it's it's one where it's like it's a hard discussion. But I think the opportunity for cider makers is to know what kind of bars they're selling to and who they're selling to. So we sell uh, pulped flair at the uh, good measure um, and I've tried different stuff we've uh, done little Pomona's first uh, like keg cider um, and because of the price and the asking of it you're basically trying to get turnover on a line and you're decreasing it by a tenth to a tenth really of what you could if you had like a pale ale on mm. so if you make something that's like easy accessible and repeatable you then have to have the consistency as a maker to know that your customer is going to get the same thing every time in in spite of it being a, a biannual product in a sense. So it's like, who who are you making the product for? And is that the thing that should go in keg is my advice to give to cider makers. Super, thank you. Susanna, welcome back. Thanks that. If, <clears throat> if you're struggling uh, to, to pick us up, maybe we'll try and continue with your camera off, but let's give it a whirl for now. I was just asking Martin and keen to get your insight as somebody who is you know, providing these these products directly to consumers. What what do you think are the are the opportunities and roles that keg ciders can play? <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. Obviously, um, Alice's dog is not so keen on the dog. Uh, Bloody dog. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> She's gone. The way I see it, we've got uh, two kind of key cider can can appeal to. The first one is um, you kind of uh, force carved, but good ciders. Um, so things like Hogan's Um they're really useful for building the trust of new customers. Um, so a lot of my. my for men at the bottle shop particularly is kind of odd because it's in some ways very niche and then in other ways we are the nice pub for a lot of people that they can walk to they're not necessarily uh craft beer drinkers or craft cider drinkers um but having a product like that on that's closer to a mainstream brand that they know gets them in the door no it means they know there's something that they're going to you know be happy drinking um, and then at the other end, we've got all these lovely keg condition ciders and we sell a lot of Ross. So we get a lot of Albert's keg condition ciders um, and we've had other people's as well. And they're really useful for getting the craft beer drinkers on board and going, oh, hang on, this is, this is listed on the same page as, you know, all our Alistair's and our two by two. Um, same way presented. And it makes it made ciders. What I've all expected. It's kind of two opposite ends of the market. Both useful in their own way. Yeah, super. Thank you. If I can pull back to uh, to a craft beer analogy here, which is in terms of just the sheer um, method of dispense uh, and mode of consumption, which is as a keg sparkling product, the finest, most modern and contemporary, and the sort of flavour driven um, beers from some really, really highly rated small craft breweries is in effect the same uh, method of, of presentation and production as any main, mainstream lager. Do we think that a um, the kegging of, of craft cider um, in the same way that, that it is, you know, carbonated, maybe potentially with some, some sweetness in there, 
does the consumer understand that there, uh, maybe even the trade broadly, does they do they understand that there is a difference between this kegged offering from smaller producers versus that from mainstream producers? Would anyone like to to have a go on this one? I don't think so. I think well, I think they. These it's an interesting co conversation that I've had actually fairly recently with the bar that we um, supply, and the conversation is what you know from the bar managers is like how um, how do I best describe the differences between your product and Orchard Pig Reveler, mm. and I which I thought was very disrespectful anyway, but <laughs> um, it is it's that kind of you know we're producing a medium cider that is very accessible, and then you've got also pig reveler which is a is very accessible again so it's um it's it's a tricky i don't think consumers do see um the differences so it falls upon the kind of the producer to educate the bar managers to a point to make and staff to make sure they are very clearly aware and have like a quick roll off the tongue difference or, or statement that they can say which is that which identifies the difference to the consumer mm. um, and if you set that up then it actually starts to be a much easier process because people get the whole what people get is things are made generally the, like you get high quality products and you get less quality products but you just need to make sure that that's all identified by the bar staff first because from a badge the perception of cider still is even for the you know even for the big draft guys is that they are producing their ciders in a from apples in the same way that we mm. are producing ciders from apples as well which is obviously all bull, you know sorry it's rubbish um, <laughs> <laughs> um, because they're not they're making them from from concentrate mm. or capitalizing them so it's a very different process um and yeah so the onus for that really falls upon on the on the bar staff yeah. I, I, I would say, yeah, just to add to that, Ed, I think education is the key word there and training. You know, these staff turnover in the hospitality industry is so high that it's extremely difficult to be able to maintain a relationship with one person. So you could sell your product really well to that person and they understand it fully. And then they're like, oh, I'm done with hospitality. The hours are awful. I'm moving on. And then you've got to start the process all over again. And nine times out of 10, you're going to get someone who comes in and they're like, I just love beer. So, you know, you have to begin again the whole education process. So, you know, events like this, this sort of platform is perfect for kind of just raising awareness really and getting that message out that cider has changed. Cider is now not just 8% still and pretty funky, you know, there are like, it's a really fantastic product and can be enjoyed by a range of people. And we still get people coming to the tap room, just sort of putting, turning their nose up at our cider range and just desperate for a lager. And I said, why don't you, why don't you like cider? And oh, I just drank way too much of it when I was 15 and I vomited and that's that. And I say, well, look, try this, try this Turner's elderflower. We'll try a bit of our crafty apple. And you know, the, you can change their attitude in five seconds. Mm -hmm. um, but it's being able to have that opportunity that, um, you know, and, and harness that and, and, and get those, get people to listen to what you're saying. Um, that, that's the challenge that we're up against, I think. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I always talk about it as a trust issue that you've got to get someone's trust within the first like five seconds of them walking in the place, which is why it's worth having a range of different st uh, stuff. And it's also why the changed uh, packaging formats are really helpful. So as that changes people's perceptions and makes them more willing to give it a taste. Uh, mm. yeah, Visibly, packaging wise, I think there's, there's definitely something there. And I think uh, people are engaging more with um, <coughs> interesting uh, kind of visual kind of connections that can work, you know, that are, you know, the fun brand that goes around the whole craft beer scene, which has just been such an influence and how cider has really started to take that on in the last few years. Mm. Um, catch people's eye you know don't overwhelm them don't go old worldy kind of be fun be playful. yeah, mm. yeah. Do, do you guys think though that um like with craft beer as the kind of counterpoint to it that was a big uh sort of counter movement towards big general bland and it was the marked point of difference in production and then branding but do you reckon most consumers 
can tell a bigger difference between, say, Bex and then a Hoppy Parallel? Do you reckon they can tell the difference between Thatcher's on draft and then a small artisanal producer? No. Or is that just us in the bubble going, no? Oh. <laughs> I don't think they have a clue. I, honestly, I don't think they have a clue. No. Um, because why do I think that? Um, I think that the step change with kind of poorly made beer and fantastically made beer has been quite slow. Mm. So it's been sort of like people have been, there've been like lots of teasers, like I'll try a bit of this and try a bit of that. And, you know, it's it's sort of grown slowly <laughs> for a long period of time. With cider, I feel like the change has come really, really quickly. Um, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but, you know, for me, sort of, four or five years ago I didn't have any kegs to sell um other than crafty apple and then suddenly you know bang it's it's it, all you guys are doing it and it's amazing and it's so exciting and I'd love to sell all of it but um it's it's almost come too quickly in a sense because, <laughs> do you know what I mean does that make sense like it's 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 almost like there's too much to choose from now and people are still a little bit scared and um you know it takes lots of Susanna's to mm. to need a lot more of, of that kind of, of place to be able to yeah. sort of people those options. That was one of the reasons why we um, someone's in an air hangar. That's <laughs> one of the reasons we decided to do something with a keg was because there wasn't really opportunities. People were bar staff were calling for keg, but there wasn't really opportunity. But like you say now there is lots of opportunity to get different ciders on keg. But the, the reason we remain to do it, or remain <laughs> stuff and kick, is because of, it's actually more about the distribution of it. So it's a way to safely, for us to safely package 30 litres of cider, it arrive in a very good condition, it look, and it, we can have, we've got small tap rooms in the northeast that are selling um, Crafty Neck number seven, we've got places down in Cornwall, Aberdeen, all of that and that and the only reason we've been able to do that is because we've put stuff in 30 litre keg the but the the bibs uh, and one-way kegs um but the bibs just don't travel well they arrive beaten up it's a struggle um <laughs> but i think yeah like you say maybe there are there are too many options now and the limiting problem of the big drinks industry uh, or drinks companies like and the pub companies, which limit cider, basically. There's what about the producers? It's the limitations of the big drinks businesses, which are, and the monopoly they have on bar for the limitations. Of the case. So the the, uh, the 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 questions here around, you know, there there suddenly been this proliferation of of a range of different types of keg ciders, and that's to be championed and celebrated, but quite challenging when only one singular line potentially might be given over to cider, whilst yeah. there are mix given to varying degrees of different kind of IPA. What do we need to do to try and change the mindset? And um, we've mentioned about education around different flavor profiles, different varieties, maybe even different processes so that cider could get maybe two lines and each pub have two as two great ciders on there. How do we achieve that? I mean, I think, uh, and just adding to that, Gabe, we don't necessarily have to be all competing for that one line. Like you say, you know, why should we have that bigger share? There's room for two, three, maybe. Mm -hmm. I think so. We, we um, when we go out and sell, and this is something that we worked on fairly recently, and actually um, inspired a little bit by uh, Kentish Pip, actually, in the way that they approach. So any mark, any material that they send out to pubs and things like that, they put the latest data and information from places like the Western Cider Report. Um, and other, other um, information available about the cider industry in their sales pitches so that bar staff can get very quickly get a snippet of information about what the demand is for cider because it's very difficult. If you're sat behind, a, well, in my opinion, if you're sat behind a bar or stood behind a bar, sorry, um, and you're only allowed to have one tap of cider on, how are you ever going to change your opinion because yeah. that cider actually can warrant more space than that because you're not mm. allowed to do it. So mm. it's, um, but if you, when you 
hand over your sales brochure and you hand over your um, the information about the different products you provide, you also have that snippet of information about the industry and what the punters actually are looking for, then all of a sudden it's a bit of a, it's, well, it's an ongoing educational put like process that person might take it to the next bar they go to and all that sort of thing mm. but it's, it's a start because you have platforms like this and you have other way you know it's kind of got to be you multifaceted this education process mm. I, 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 change. I think a, a big proponent of change is from a small side of drinkers so the amount of people that went into pubs like do you do craft beer like literally major pub codes like i don't even know what that is and oh. then it gets to a point where they see it's profitable and they go oh nice. we can take a slice of that pie and yeah. the more things like this in 750 mil bottles i don't think any of these would really work on draft uh in a pint capacity really the big bowls mm. but the discussion around them and then the scene that evolves out of it you then get people that do go to the pub and they will ask what ciders have you got and I, again i don't think any drink has benefited from being singular you don't go into a pub and go what beer have you got oh just the one <laughs> just yeah just one solitary yeah. beer it's yeah. it's not it's not binary and we kind of have to prove that cider as a category isn't binary before we expect it to change for profit profitability of pubs etc I, I, I would also just to add to that as well i think having a bit of respect for the product obviously we are passionate about cider and perry let's not forget perry because kegged perry is absolutely banging glorious stuff <laughs> love, love love that stuff it's just great we don't have a drop of perry downstairs hence why i've got a big old oliver's palette coming in next week um because people love it here it's it's, it's i've seen a real demand for it recently which is lovely um but where was I going with this? Yeah, so just to get some respect for the product and, and, the, and the kind of um, sector itself. So I get involved, well, I try not to get involved with these sort of dirty pricing wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go in and I'll be like, well, this is list price for Crafty. And they'll immediately go, well, I pay X amount for, I don't know, whatever it is. Orchard crafty food, nectar. Yeah, crafty, <laughs> yeah, I pay 50 quid for a 30 litre of crafty nectar. And I'm like, Ugh. And to kidding. be brutally honest, if you're going to the right sort of places, I mean, maybe not every craft bar is like me, but as soon as someone starts trying to sell me something because it's cheaper, I'm like, yeah. well, what's wrong with it then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I don't want something to be sold to me because it's cheaper. I want it to be sold to me because it's really good. And and and, yeah. and this is so actually, I I sort of I gave the price to um, one of the GMs, and he said, "Well, I get X for for X, and it was a lot cheaper." And maybe in years gone by, I would have gone, oh, "Well, fine, I can price match that," just because I was so desperate to get in and and get some sort of. Um, mm. exposure for the product but I just said oh actually you know what you're all right I'll, I'll go sell it to someone who'll pay for it and what did I get a text the next day just being like oh actually do you know what yeah we'll go for it and you know I think for me now going forward that's something that I'm gonna sort of hold on to um mm. I think negotiated deals is fine um but also you know respecting keg cider for what it is is really important but on a on a flip answer to that as well, it the the industry is kind of a bit uh, buckled by that because those kind of uh, price wars, the pubs don't pass on that cheapness to the customer, so they've got the option of a yeah. three fifty pint that isn't as high quality, but it's cheap. Yeah. They yeah. get the same thing at four ninety a pint. Mm -hmm. So then consumers <laughs> go, oh well, I pay that. Uh, all ciders are the same really and it kind of it really inflates the market in the wrong point so that you can't have a market difference and say this is the cheaper not as well made alternative this is the high quality one a lot of people just see oh it's all the ciders always the same price they don't even bother changing the name on the uh menu it's just cider it yeah. just seems like... yeah. yeah it doesn't warrant a name <laughs> <laughs> I've got, um, I'm going to bring up one point uh, and then we're going to do uh, answer some questions and then come on to some of the more sort of aesthetic part um, of, of Keg Cider and some of the, uh, the, the design and the advocacy there. And it comes around um, cider naturally, uh, classically fermenting out in the five and a half to seven and a half as a, as a broad and a little bit either side. But let's say in that space, which is classically and typically a bit bit higher than a than a sessionable alcohol drink so and so if you want to create that sessionability there are things that you have to do with a dilution with water and or juice 
etc so how, how does that pose potential challenges or uh, does cider need to think about how again certain craft beer brands have, have approached that in terms of um, suggesting that the serve might be in two-third of a pint and just trying to change the mode of consumption rather than to being really quick to savouring it on draft. What are the thoughts on that? Well, I certainly just automatically, I, our standard half glasses are stemmed half glasses that are two-thirds to brim. So uh, basically any measure we serve up to two-thirds goes into a stemmed glass. Um, and it does, again, it's just it's that changing perception thing. Um, and so you, and we're quite... Uh, open about the fact that every draft product we sell, we we don't prescribe that certain products can't be bought by the pint. But if we really do think a product would be better in a smaller measure, then the list price on the board will be, you know, however, what is it, four or five quid for two thirds or whatever it is, rather than four or five quid for a pint. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Super. Mm -hmm. Well, Any Sam, other... Yeah, Sam, mm. you, you make the keg <clears throat> stuff. What's your approach with the liquid and getting it into the pubs? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm always prepared to be completely honest about my products and my Nightbird, which is our kind of session cider that has, we, it's it's always been aimed at a certain kind of point. We wanted to kind of compete and get onto that keg line, get on the front. It's, it's diluted slightly. To bring it down to four point nine percent because there was this glass ceiling of the I think that's changed massively, but there was definitely a glass ceiling of five percent. Five percent itself was too high, over five percent was too high, four point nine was like this sweet spot. If you do four point five, no, I'm not prepared to do that to my product, but we worked we could make four point nine work, and I think it's a great product. And yes, there is a compromise, but it's still a quality product, and that makes it accessible. Then our other keg product, well, Disco is five and a half percent. That's as strong as it is. You know, that is how it comes out. So it's we've been able to bring that cider in since because there's people have there's been an appetite for it. But it's yeah, no, it's 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 tough. And I think I think transparency is kind of key. I'm sorry, mm. I've lost my train of thought there, guys. That's right. <laughs> no, no, no worries. <laughs> No worries. I think we'll, we're going to jump into some questions now. Actually, we've had some good uh, some good questions put in. Um, uh, first of all, I'm going to refer to uh, a question from Kingsley Ash from Thornborough Cider, recent winners of the Sanford Orchards Breakthrough Cider Maker Awards. Congratulations, Kingsley! What size? Uh, what keg size do bars and pubs prefer? Twenty liters like bib to get the product lines moving fast, or something bigger to keep the cost down? I would say it depends on precisely what type of line it is going back to what i was mm. saying before so if it's um the the one that's mainstream ish to get people drinking it in the first place then um and particularly if you're sticking to one line then a big keg works great change it less often um the other end of the scale the keg conditioned live ciders um that i'm changing on a regular basis and i want different varieties i prefer those in 20s because it does keep the turnover going and people like to see change mm. they, they want to know that they can come in and get something they're going to like but they like variety mm. um, yeah from a sorry martin just to buy in um from a from a distributor <laughs> sorry my bad from a distributor <laughs> position um i would uh, we personally prefer 30 liters just because they're so much easier to manage to lift mm -hmm. or the 50s are really hard work physically yeah. you know, dropping into cellars um storing in the warehouse putting in the van so yeah from yeah. absolutely versus the other way so we like i said we get uh we get pulp flare and flares in 50s uh which yeah i've now got uh the back like the letter c from just lifting and chucking them. I'm only a small lad. But um, the there's a sort of balancing point if you're going for like a, a, a commercial style cider, let's say, of if it's in a smaller vessel, that's great because you can turn it over. But then there's the add-on cost that your gross profit margin will actually be you'll have to increase the price more per litre because the producer's passing on the uh, cost of the product as well. But there's also, if you've got uh, something that's big, keg, even a 30 litre keg, if the line's slow and you have to clean the line once, maybe twice, you've thrown away four or five pints out of that keg minimum 
and that's in excluding tasters and everything. So before mm -hmm. you've even finished the keg, you've actually wasted quite a big chunk of it just making sure that it actually sells, which is why there's a big sort of hesitance to even take on keg. So I prefer big ones if it's something I know I can sell, lovely. Yeah. But what excites me are the little cool things. But then I would get them in bottle to yeah. then get people excited and then get them on the pints when they're out for pints. Yeah, I agree with that. I could go with what Alice said as well. I mean, I maybe it's because I'm weak, um, but I you know, <laughs> three, no, 30, 30 litre keg full is best part of 40 kilos straight away. Yep. That's yeah. a lot away. And I moving those around, if you're kegging and you're getting hefting them in and out of the van, that's hard work enough. Uh, I don't want to put my staff through that. I know I know the stairs that have to be gone up and the, and the, and the cellars that we have to clamber down. So it's that's a big, for me, that's the reason why we probably will never do a 50 litre mm. I, uh, I worked in a Green King pub years and years ago and we were getting Cronenberg by the 18. And uh, if you've ever seen one of those, it's like a small bungalow. Yeah. Uh, and well, the, <laughs> the lift broke in, one, in the pub once and they were like, you have to take it down the stairs. And the stairs looked like they'd been drawn badly yeah. in an animation for like, we've just got to draw some background stairs. Like, and they were literally like to me, your minimum wage, you can, uh, you can carry that down. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but 50s are that difference in like 20 odd kilos more it is a yeah. hefty lot and just even twisting and, and kegs are less maneuverable than casks as well because i'll you know i'll happily shift yeah. a 40 litre cask around mm. quite happily but a 50 litre keg is only another 10 kilos but it's a lot less manageable yeah yeah, yeah. Well, i think um, 30 litres as well uh you can you can chuck them on with a courier so yeah. if you want to branch yeah. out from your local area, um, you can chuck a steel or a one-way keg on, on with a courier and it can be distributed, it's absolutely fine. Mm, so yeah. 30 litres, 50s for some big wholesalers. Yeah, like, say, like Martin said, for some customers, we do like a very small, we have a customer that takes 50s, but then the rest of them are all on 30s. Super. Thanks, guys. On to the next question. Paul Rolf. Hi, Paul. Is there any shelf life difference between uh, bag in box and keg? Yes. Absolutely. Next question. I suspect, first of all, it depends on whether you're talking about uh, whether the, the bag in box is something that has been placed into there without any form of stabilization, any pasteurization, or let's assume that it has been pasteurized, um, like it's likely that a uh, a keg would. Is, is there any difference between those, those, those two products? I think for me, the, the difference, I mean, there's not a whole lot of whole lot of difference really in in terms like a pasteurized bag and box will will last for six to six months to 12 months if it's not open and once it is open you can comfortably rely that it will be good for two to three weeks probably mm. you would say but there, there are issues that come with oxidization with bag and boxes and the clips that are designed for when they come they're pulled through on the hand pull they're not they're not they're not great and they're no. alive, but they also can sometimes let a bit more oxygen in than you mm. want and so the ciders oxidize quicker and ruin quicker so yeah that's why keg for the high value perception of cider hpv yeah. is that what you call it gabe from the foundation course um available through crafty nectar um <laughs> uh, yeah it's, um it keg is way better for the value perception of cider definitely yeah, there's uh, with the dispense is like a great conversation to that because there's so many times where I've been in somewhere and uh, they've it wine's a great example, bag and box wine. Uh, oh, it lasts way longer than a bottle. Yeah, but if you pour it and you accidentally tilt the box up or whatever and you let oxygen in, it's just like leaving a bottle open. So it's it's understanding it in the same way that kegs. There's so many times I've been into pubs where they've uh, got a tiny leak in the CO2, they've turned off the gas overnight. Uh, it's leached out and then the keg coupler has a non-return valve but it isn't really a non-return valve and yeah. then the keg is flat and they're like oh something's happened to it and it's like oh but all these things in theory uh they're both stable great things but ha who 
who are you selling it to and how likely are they to treat it with respect that is really how you get your difference in shelf life in my opinion yeah yeah my answer was how long is it because you can keep this well <laughs> if they're kept cool from sauce to, to to drinker but so many people don't you know it's there are problems with all of these and it depends so much on the on lots of different variables i think yeah mm. Adding on quickly to what Martin was saying, I think that's the key thing. It's probably more relevant to your last cake cider session, but um, the problems in the bar problems and the seller problems with keg, and so often, especially when we started out, and I didn't have confidence in keg, um, the um, the response was, "There's a problem with it. It's overcarbed, or it's undercarbed, or it's not working, and all this kind of stuff." I had to teach myself and educate my that problems. And from a sales point of view, for myself and for my brother, who's doing the sales calls and when we're doing deliveries, is understanding how you kind of educate people or kind of point them in the right direction, knowing what to do and say, what pressures they're working at, what gases they're using, all that kind of stuff is important. And mm. Mm. super. Okay, um, Dick Witherkem, the wonderful Dick Witherkem of Manchester, has asked about keg conditioned cider. Susanna mentioned it earlier on. He says, "Is it a thing?" For anybody who's um, uncertain, we're talking about a, a live product whereby it's undergone a small secondary fermentation uh, in the keg, uh, uh, akin to a, a, a bottle conditioned beer or cider, effectively. What, what, uh, um, Susanna, we know that you're a fan and a, and a proponent of, of keg conditioned. Is this something that is going to revolutionize the world of craft cider, do we think? No, but I think it's certainly a part of it. Mm. Um, like I said before, I think it's a really useful thing for um, craft beer drinkers in particular that are used now to keg conditioned beer, for example, um, live real ale, but don't like still cider. Um, I think it, that's where it really has its its market. And also just, so you, you know, then you start talking about uh, single varieties or you see all these small batches because the keg conditioned ones tend to be much smaller batches and they just tend to kind of work in the same way as people are now used to um single um batches of a particular beer that a brewery does um and they get talked about more and hyped a bit more and all of that kind of cultural stuff around it just seems to work a little bit better and chime a bit better with the craft beer drinkers so it's a really useful way in for them in from a distributor's um perspective kind of and from a commercial perspective i guess that for us, we use bag in box to showcase um, kind of a cider maker's range um, and also the 750 mil bottles too. Uh, and then we prefer to just stick with a cider maker's, um, you know, kind of pale ale equivalent um, so a keg, basically. Mm. So I love Albert's keg condition range. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And we would have it on in our tap room, but I wouldn't be able to buy a pallet off it, of it off him, sadly, because... I'd be sitting there for months. So yeah, it's it's one of those where for me, I I love the liquids, uh, um, but the the problem is it's speaking to kind of us in the niche. It's like our thing that we like, and it's hard to get people involved in that when there's a barrier of even understanding cider in its basic parameters to uh -huh. understanding why this is this way. And you see, to... that's where I disagree. I, that's precisely why I like it, because it gets mm. those people. I mean, the amount of Foxwell now, keg conditioned Foxwell, we fly through. I can hear Kath enjoying <laughs> this. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I've got people drinking that that just didn't think they liked cider mm. because I can say, well, everyone in my um, staff will, will say to people, try places that taste like sour town plastics. Um, and you can just give that to them and, and just tell people to taste it. And they go, hang on, cider tastes like that. And but, then you start talking about, well, yeah, it's live cider mm. and it's um, single variety and it's full juice way in and then they start looking at the other siders as well yeah. yeah i suppose the question is is that as a result of it being keg conditioned or because it's an excellent cider a single varietal cider or a really really bold idiosyncratic cider and that's something maybe all of all the above do. depending <laughs> on the person <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know i think i think it's, yeah it is what it is but i get i think that we often talk about the less the cons that are used within the cider industry and they're vast and I think 
does keg condition really describe and tell you what a product's going to be like when it's coming out? So I don't know whether or not it is a is a it's just a kind of. Well, I quite like the term keg nat, but but people don't. Uh... <laughs> Going back to Martin's point, maybe it is just a step too far in a in a in, in an industry that's still severely lacking in understanding anyway. Yeah. Well, my 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 thing is, uh, it's just the turnover. That's that's the and we're yeah. five minutes ago we were talking about the one tap only thing. Yeah, so yeah. if that one tap is a fox whelp and fox oh, whelp's a divisive apple, then yes, you're kind I... of you're limiting your keg and I'm gonna have to clean that four times and then tip it away and call up Ross and go, sorry mate, uh <laughs> yeah. need a credit note for off. Yes, I, I agree. I'm in a lucky position here and uh, I've got, you know, uh, uh, when we set up the bottle shop we we put in a lot more keg lines and I kind of in my head three of those lines one of the cask lines one of the four cask lines and uh two of the keg lines are cider well it sounds like um, a bloody lovely place that I'm going to be does. visiting yeah and I've, <laughs> I've got three double bottle fridges and one of those is full of cider as well. oh, <laughs> yes, guys I'm going to I'm going to move the conversation on because we, we've still got some yeah. some ground to cover Ed briefly I would just say that keg condition is a a description of the process like a cascale that but that pertains to a range of different flavor profiles but it's more the, the mode of production i suppose let's talk a bit about um branding and aesthetics um sam you're somebody who uh you really invest in trying to make sure as 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 does alice indeed ed as well you really all put a uh, place an emphasis on being bold and being bright and being creative um how do you convey that when you don't have much room to kind of play with on the on the on the on the pump? Well, I feel it's less is more, but that's very much the kind of part back part of my brands, and it's just been about being fun and playful, and it's kind of catching people's attention. Yes, Martin, exactly. Um, <laughs> and I just, I just think it needs to be clear. It needs to do what it says in the tin. Um, that's my take on it. Yeah. On talking about tins, I um, <laughs> I was looking around the office and I was, I was thinking, what looks good in here? What's good in here? And I grabbed this. So it's it's actually water. It's black ace. It's a 500 yeah. mil um, sparkling water can. But I just think it looks great because it's um, it's minimal. It's kind of making water sexy. Mm. And I think it that comes in 50 litre kegs now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, from, from our perspective, um, we have our own keg cider that I've mentioned, Crafty Apple here. And um, yeah, so we like the minimalist look, but we also like the busy look, but we don't like obvious. So just because it's made of apples doesn't mean that you have to put a gigantic apple on the front. Like with beer, often you look at a can and you're like, that has nothing to do with hops at all, but it looks really sexy and really I, cool. I'm going to look really hot drinking that. <laughs> I don't drink cider unless it's got a farmyard animal on the label. That's just 100% <laughs> of the thing. Um, a, a thing, oh, it's, 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 it's like a, an association of brand and quality uh, is always like a key thing to get people involved in uh, any drink. But I think cider has suffered for the longest out of all the kind of crafty beverages. Um, and one of the things that's happening is a lot of bars in the last uh, eight years or so uh, made the change over to be they're the brand themselves. So they've actually stripped back all the branding. There's no tap uh, images it's just like the one big board and that's kind of like this uh kind of insular decision so that when you go in you go oh i don't know what it is and then go oh here's my high gp line do you like pale ale like that's yeah. it's an in, in, intentional decision and i think that actually works inside his favor sometimes and that people go oh what's oliver's and you're like oh it's yeah. do you like sour beer and i've sold stuff like yeah. that with uh, a pump clip that's basically my handwriting because they forgot to send the bloody clip. Yeah. yeah. For us, for us, it was always the branding is always, I think, just it's another opportunity to to make a point of difference. So, mm -hmm. well, you know, if you've got it on a keg badge, having something bright and bold on a keg badge is brilliant because it stands out. But it's the same. It's the same on your bottles, and they shouldn't. You know, the the, the bottles or the kegs or the keg badges or whatever they shouldn't shouldn't just be thought of as a vessel for the liquid that's inside. There's, it's an opportunity to create a whole culture around your brand and the experience from being, you know, looking 
at something bright and bold and thinking what is that and trying to work it out to then trying the product as well it's all all mm. ties into kind of creating a longevity around the customers that are consuming the product mm. yeah agreed and and you know additional bits and bobs like um you know merchandise and uh, bar runners and drip mats they absolutely love it gms love free stuff so you know sharing and it's something that um sam i know you do you guys do really well with the additional bits of promo and um yeah if you can just sort of shower general managers with with that stuff they absolutely lap it up and there are not enough beer towels, towels in this world anymore give out more beer towels yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right, guys, we've got we've got a handful, uh, sorry, just a, a handful of questions to go. And we're, we're rapidly running out of time, actually. Larry Nelson says, what age band is most receptive to craft cider? For example, students familiar with craft beer or young professionals with disposable income? 14 to 17. Years, <laughs> I think. That's the, On the, the market. <laughs> our, from, a retail, from our retail statistics, pretty much our... It's a 50-50 split in terms of men and women that are buying it. And the people that are buying the single brands from the, the marketplace, they tend to be relatively to kind of 18, 35, because the products are, um, but you're looking at more towards that higher end. And that's because of the, the, the price points of the products. But I think people, are, all the statistics suggest that people are drinking less, particularly the younger guys, and spending more money on high quality products. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's certainly that what I see. Would mean, you know, craft cider based on the data should be more appealing to 18 to 25 year olds at the moment because they like spending their money on good quality and savoring their pints. Whereas people like us, which are a bit older, have gone through that generation of just smashing whatever they can for getting as much value for money. Yeah. Um, so it's changed it's changed i think it's changing across age groups though and and i think in the older age groups they're maybe looking at it more from a point of view of um having got into wine as well um so if they're if they're used to spending 15 quid on a nice bottle of wine they'll come in and see the 750s and um and then that that's their way in whereas the younger age groups as you say are really interested in the the craft um keg products they seem to go a bit more mm. we we yeah. had uh, broad, very broad generalizations um we had uh pilt and scarlet sharp on keg in the pub uh last year no must have been the year before when everyone could drink in a place uh but um it was literally me one other guy and about 30 women that drank the keg. Uh, it, it was the wit like proper not even a fruited drink it was like oh do you like these flavors and the guys are going, nah, not really. And it was just this conversation that we're like, just chatting to someone about Keeved cider over the bar. Uh, and yeah, it was it was pretty much like ninety percent women and then me, if I'm honest. <laughs> so like, depending on if it's just straight apple or experimental, the it's the similar to sour beer. Like that was one for us in a I run a bottle shop, and the amount of just like sour beers you'd sell to women, it was about three times the amount of guys. It was insane. Yeah. yeah. Super. Thanks, guys. OK, moving on. Uh, Alex Metcalf, who is the uh, learning and discovery manager at Camera. Hi, Alex. He says we're commissioning beginners cider format content for the L&D pages. Um, and is there anything the panel could think of in terms of educational content that they would think would be useful for the consumer at a sort of beginner's level? What do we think, guys? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Good question. It's a bit deep. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm biased, but I think we all should be talking more about faults. Ah, but I'm biased because I've already done that video. How, how to okay. get people? How to get people into cider? It's like these are the things that are awful about it. Yeah, welcome. Well, no, no, bad, no. Okay, maybe not quite at the absolute beginner, but I do think we we should. I think the reason why it's useful to talk about faults early on is that um, so many people will try a cider and go, oh, that's awful, um, and think that that's what all cider tastes like. And then you taste it yourself and you're like, no, that's just, you know, really faulty. Mm -hmm. Yep. First one big cider so, I had there's... from a cider bar was like that. Tastes like dog yeah. slobber. And I was like, that's proper cider. It's like, no, it isn't. No, this, is <laughs> this is dead. This is dead. <laughs> because what I mean is there's this perception that cider is always going to be fine. Whereas most people know that 
um, you know, a cast beer could be bad. You know, they might not have cleaned their lines, might be what they put it down to. But there's there's a much more of a kind of realisation that cask beer can be bad or faulty or even if they don't know why or how. Yeah. Um- the the benefit beer had is that you have beer styles and uh, they're markedly different in image, aroma, taste. Um, and I think we need to actually kind of let cider stand on its own two feet and make a point of when it is a marked difference. And I've said this, I know it's uh, mates with Pilton, but like Keeving's a great example of something where it's like, it's sweet cider and you could sell it as sweet or medium cider. But using that language and repeating it, I think it will yeah. take off in the same way that like people now talk about hops that had no idea what hops were in any means. And if they were even in beer, it was like just inconsequential. But now they, they know varieties and everything. And I think region, uh, region method and production are three things that we need to really show at the market difference to get people to go, oh, I like Keeve ciders rather than like, I like everything from Devon because your granddad's mate in Devon in that shed isn't making the same as, say, Sanford Orchards, is he? It's like, <laughs> yeah, I yeah diff- like showcasing the difference, the disparity or the difference between the different sectors of the UK and how they make their ciders. That's probably the key. Because if I think back to uh, this, is maybe going to be a bit of a long winded story. I don't know what it's well, like. Well, just, just in time for 1227. We're rapidly <laughs> running out of time. So give us the abridged version if you could. Yeah, so I had a guy that worked for me. He came from the wine industry, and he used to get really excited about wines and started being excited about ciders. But then he then found it difficult to get as excited about the wines as he could about the ciders because people were blending them. And obviously with the blends and things, there's not a massive range of difference between, well, there obviously is, but to the train tongue. But there, there are clear differences between Eastern County ciders and West Country ciders, there's a clear difference between a Perry and a, you know, and a cider. So if you make it simple for newcomers coming in to showcase um, those differences across the board, like with Keep Cider or Ice Cider, if you had a discovery box that allowed them to see all of those aspects. Someone's selling right. their discovery box, aren't they? Crafty next. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't actually plugging it, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the website that does that already. Long story short, sure, here's my box. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, everybody, we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, Alice, Martin, Ed, Sam, and Susanna, thank you all very much for participating. Really, really insightful. A lot of uh, important and insightful discussion there. Really appreciate it. To everybody watching, I hope you enjoyed taking these salient points away. Do check out our panelists via websites and social media. They're really important people within our burgeoning cider industry. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of CraftCon. See you down the pub sometime. Thank you, Thanks. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Do we stay? Do we stay? <laughs> Is it no, oh, it's oh, I'm just, I'm going to stay here chatting. I'm not bothered. No. <laughs> oh, Gabe's coming back. We got rid of him, Gabe. <laughs> Why are we here? What's are happening? We, I, it's, I, I think, I think we should, I think we should leave because um, people start, <laughs> still, still can view this and we need to get on with our, we need to get on with our day. So have a great day. Well, guys. <laughs>